Hello everyone and welcome to our webinar on formulation design of cosmetic products through diffusing wave spectroscopy. I am Colin Bretz, Sales and Marketing Manager at LS Instruments, and I will be monitoring this event today. I would like to start by introducing our guest speaker, Professor Samuel Amin from Manhattan College. Prior to his appointment in 2018, Samuel Amin has been working in industrial research and development for more than 20 years and has held senior roles at multiple global companies. He has also served on several international committees in soft matter, colloids, and protein irrigation, and has chaired multiple international scientific conferences. This webinar is brought to you by LS Instruments. We are a Swiss company founded 10 years ago as a spin-off from the University of Fribourg, and our specialty is light scattering technologies, namely dynamic light scattering, static light scattering and diffusing wave spectroscopy. Our goal is to provide our customers with the most advanced and trusted solutions to help them solve their analytical challenges. And um, below in this window, I'm just showing a few examples for global customers. I would also like to remind you that this webinar is interactive and that you're welcome to submit your questions through the chat that you can see on the lower right side of this window. They will be addressed um, at the end of the presentation in a Q&A session. And for now, I would like to hand it over to Samuel for the main presentation. All right. Thank you so much, Colleen, for the introduction. And again, uh, thank you so much for the opportunity to kind of uh, give this webinar today on kind of utilizing diffusing wave spectroscopy to help with formulation design of, of cosmetic products. Um, so before I begin, I just want to give you an introduction of uh, Manhattan College uh, and, and the program there. So I sit within the chemical engineering department, exactly as uh, Colleen stated. Um, however, within the chemical engineering department, we have uh, created special um, concentration areas of focus, uh, both in terms of uh, course coursework as well as uh, kind of a research. Uh, and these include primarily cosmetic engineering, biopharmaceutical engineering, and petroleum engineering. So kind of students, both at the undergraduate and master's levels, can specialize in any of these three areas. Uh, the cosmetic and the biopharma uh, uh, concentration areas are definitely quite unique. Um, and all of these concentration areas are registered with the state of New York. So we can officially kind of put that on the transcript of, of the students. So one of the things we do in, in, the, uh, in, the, in the college uh, in, under these specific concentration areas is that we build specialized courses uh, to uh, kind of build a domain knowledge for the, for the students in that specific uh, industrial sector. So, uh, for cosmetics, for example, it includes courses in formulations, polymers, emulsions, colloids, um, but it also includes aspects about scale up and uh, processing. So again, it kind of really helps them kind of understand uh, the formulation of co uh, co complex fluids as they relate to kind of uh, cosmetic products uh, and not only kind of developing them in the lab, but being able to understand kind of the scale up and processing aspects and understanding the challenges which are associated with that aspect of it as well. Um, we do have a state of the art a formulation and characterization lab, which includes a high throughput uh, formulation platforms, but also includes advanced characterization techniques uh, of which the diffusing wave, wave spectroscopy uh, is a critical component. Uh, and I'll go through that in details as you'll see in the talk. Um, we do do a lot of research collaborations with leading global companies uh, on multiple different areas of uh, mostly focused on sustainability. Uh, again, I'll kind of talk about that today, but then also on other areas such as smart materials, etc. And we do kind of have a very strong interconnectivity with all the cosmetic and, and consumer goods company, especially in the, the tri-state area of New York, New Jersey and, and Connecticut. We also do uh, training courses for uh, industry. So we have uh, last year and this year, we're, we're going to do training courses which are uh, co-organized with the Society of Cosmetic Chemists. So um, again, where we provide training 
uh, hands-on training in terms of not only formulating but also carrying out uh, advanced characterization uh, to various of the techniques that we have in, in lab. So again, something for you to keep in mind. And we also host um, a bunch of uh, international conferences uh, on soft matter. Uh, we just did the uh, Northeast Complex Fluids uh, workshop here in January. And then um, we, have, uh, we have scheduled initially uh, uh, cos uh, co uh, cosmetics conference in Manhattan, but unfortunately due to COVID now that's become a virtual. Uh, but again, you can find, um, uh, I can send you kind of details of those uh, training courses and, and conferences if you're uh, interested. So that's a short introduction of kind of the, the program at Manhattan College. But uh, let's kind of move on now into, into kind of the, the real topic that we want to talk about today. So if you look at the cosmetic industry sector, you'll see that primarily that there are some very strong consumer drivers, right, which are kind of dictating R&D, if you will, and kind of moving R&D in, in that direction because that's what you, the consumers or the customers are, are, are looking for. And if you look at kind of some of the drivers, there are kind of a certain things there which consumers are highlighting, which is impacting on their kind of uh, purchase behavior. And of them, if you see the one in highlighted in, in red here, is that there is an increasing demand for natural ingredients in cosmetic products, right? So co consumers really want natural, more biodegradable materials. And you might have heard of this term clean cosmetics, right? Uh, what does that entail? It entails primarily um, obviously moving into kind of these more sustainable biodegradable ingredients, but it also includes kind of cutting down on the number of ingredients as well so, so that you can get the same sort of efficacy, but from fewer number of ingredients. And you'll see, uh, I think uh, uh, maybe a year ago or two years ago, there were some ads out from uh, Johnson & Johnson where we're, they were talking about their baby products and talking about kind of 50% reduction in terms of their uh, number of ingredients, which you will see on, on the back of the bottle. So, so that's interesting. It's very interesting as we move towards higher sustainability and we move towards kind of uh, uh, trying to create a, a greener, more environmentally friendly world that we obviously need to kind of take into account this in our formulations. Um, and we obviously, that entails using both biodegradable products, but also kind of cutting down on the number of ingredients and trying to make the product, the ingredients that we have more multifunctional, right? So that they can kind of be able to do multiple different functions within the, within the formulation. So what does that mean for a formulator, right? So you're a formulator sitting in an R&D lab in one of the con cosmetic or consumer companies. What does this mean to you? So what it means is, is the following, right? So you are going to now switch to novel sustainable chemistries, novel ingredients. You're going to cut down on the number of ingredients that you have in your product. And what that entails primarily is that um, that's great, uh, but the reality is that if you give a consumer a product, they will still expect the performance benefits that you were giving them in your original products, right? So an example, a pretty simple example is that you might create the most green and uh, sustainable biodegradable shampoo uh, that you can with sustainable packaging. You put it on a store shelf in, in, in Target or, or Walmart, the consumer buys it, they take it home, and then when they open it, they pour it into your hands. It's like water. It just runs through your hands. You start kind of uh, lathering up uh, in, in the shower. It doesn't foam. Um, so, so from all the kind of the cues that the consumer takes from a product to kind of indicate efficacy, it's not showing any of that. It doesn't have the right biology. It doesn't have the right surface properties. And that's why it's not giving you the performance benefits in terms of the product texture or in terms of the um, kind of uh, the, uh, the foaming capability, for example or it might not be conditioning uh, correctly because you're not doing engineering the conservation correctly. So there's lots of different things which, uh, which um, the consumer expects, but if you don't re-engineer them back into your formulation, uh, you're not gonna sell any product, uh, although they might be the most sustainable product. 
So, so that in, entails re-establishing the structure property performance linkages, right? So obviously you're going to put in novel sustainable chemistries. Um, these are going to give you certain phase behavior. Uh, processing can have an impact on that because some of these systems are metastable, such as hair conditioners or skin creams. Um, and from there, basically, this microstructure and this phase behavior um, and, the, and, the, and the chemistry of the materials that you have in there is going to give rise to some of the physical chemical properties which are going to dictate on the performance characteristics. So these include things like what's the structuring at the air-water interface or at the oil-water interface, and that's going to have an impact on foaming, cleansing, and... Um, and also on kind of um, uh, kind of emulsion stability because a lot of these products are emulsions. Um, then, in terms of rheology, again, uh, rheology is also have an, it has an impact on stability of the product, but also on the sensory and texture. Uh, and in some cases, some functional benefits like hair conditioning uh, is is driven a lot by kind of the viscosity breakdown on dilution of a of a conditioning shampoo or a conditioner. So again, rheology plays a role. And again, obviously, deposition and deposit film structure uh, is going to have an impact on, on kind of uh, things like uh, lubrication and conditioning as well, right? So, so all of these physical chemical properties are going to give rise to the performance criteria. So again, you have to reestablish this connection between microstructure, between these novel ingredients, the microstructure, uh, the physical chemical properties and the uh, performance criteria. And in order to optimize your formulation, you have to go through this knowledge-based optimization loop uh, in order to achieve uh, kind of high performance products. So that's what it means from a formulation perspective that, uh, that I want to kind of take these novel sustainable ingredients, but ensure that I'm getting the right level of performance that a consumer will like from that perspective, okay? So I'm gonna show this by one example today. And uh, one of the uh, things I'm gonna talk about is um, kind of a surfactant-based uh, structured system, um, which is very, very common in shampoos and body washes. And that's uh, the system known as uh, SLES cab, cab B, uh, which is common term in formulators language in, in, uh, in uh, R&D, in consumer goods and, and cosmetic companies. So SLES is a sodium lauryl ethyl sulfate, uh, cap B is cocoa amidopropyl betaine, uh, SLES is a, is a anionic surfactant, while as cap B is a, is a common zoterionic. Um, So the, when you are creating surfactant-based products like body washes or shampoos or cleansers or hair conditioners, the surfactant uh, system itself uh, plays multiple roles. It is multifunctional. Uh, I, if you remember I was saying multifunctional products or ingredients, uh, surfactants are actually multifunctional. They don't just do one function uh, in your product. They actually uh, can impact on multiple different functions. And that's why it's important to optimize them in order to, again, move towards this aspect about clean cosmetics with fewer ingredients doing the job. Um, so for surfactants, uh, they have uh, three areas where they kind of impact on the performance. They impact on the rheology, and that's what we'll focus on today in terms of sensory and in-use sensory. Uh, they affect uh, cleansing efficacy. Uh, they affect foaming. So all of these aspects are, are, are critical if you think about a, a body wash or shampoo. Um, and uh, in, if you're talking about a conditioner, they actually impact also on conditioning performance. So again, uh, that's an important aspect uh, to keep in mind as well. So again, uh, these are multifunctional products from that perspective. So let's uh, start with the kind of talking about rheology in these systems. Uh, and talk a little bit about what is the micellar structure of your traditional uh, body washes and shampoos, the ones that you see in the current market, right? Um, uh, nowadays, obviously, there's a lot of uh, uh, aspects about sulfate-free and moving away from sulfate-based products, SLES, obviously, sulfate-based product. But these are the traditional workhorse type of uh, surfactant systems currently in the market. So if you look at this system, uh, the system, as I mentioned, is a mixture of anionic uh, sodium lauryl ethyl sulfate and zoterionic cap B. 
Um, and the betaines um, in the presence of salt are known to interact very strongly with these anionic surfactants like SDS and SLES. And they form long elongated micelles known as worm-like micelles. And here in the, in the graphic at the bottom of this slide, you can see this kind of transition uh, where uh, you kind of get to these long elongated worm-like micelles. You can look at uh, under it under cryo-TEM. But that's a very difficult technique uh, in order to kind of really implement in, in practice. Um, so you want a technique which will kind of give you some more insights quickly as in, as in, as in very simple uh, kind of methodology to kind of establish it. So that's where the, the DWS kind of comes in. Um, and um, one of the things which is important to uh, understand is that the one like my cells, and you can think of it, if you want to visualize it, you can visualize it as like a, a bowl of cooked spaghetti, if you will, where you have the spaghetti all entangled. And primarily, uh, there is kind of a couple of structural parameters which dictate the performance of these worm-like micelles. So one is the contour length or the LC, which is the end-to-end -end distance of this uh, worm, one of the worm-like micelles. Then you have the entanglement point, which is basically, basically LE, which is the distance between entanglements. Um, uh, you also have uh, the persistence length, which is LP, which gives you a measure of flexibility of the uh, of the worm like micelle. So is this a long flexible micelle or is it actually quite stiff and is not that flexible, right? So, and, and all of that dictates the kind of the rheological performance uh, of these worm like micelles. So in order to kind of um, engineer the, the rheological performance, uh, one would need to kind of engineer a lot of these microstructural characteristics, if you will, from that perspective. So, um, uh, in general, um, it's very easy to build up viscosity in this SLES cap B system. Uh, you'll see data here on in terms of viscosity uh, build up uh, with um, kind of salt concentration of this SLES cap B. When you just have SLES uh, uh, by itself without any cap B. Uh, it's pre pretty much very low viscosity and almost a Newtonian fluid. You'll see there's no shear thinning characteristics, almost uh, slightly above water-based viscosity. As you start uh, including cap B and then you keep on adding salt concentrations, you build up extreme viscosity in these systems, um, but that reaches a maximum. And after that, you start to lose viscosity as you keep on adding, um, uh, adding more salt. And that's further elucidated in these uh, samples, and you'll see the figure on the top where you see these uh, samples have been uh, made and they've just been inverted over uh, primarily pretty soon after you've kind of formulated them and they've kind of gone into solution. And you'll see that the flow properties are very different. You'll see the samples in the middle, uh, which are kind of say 250, 325, these are salt levels. Uh, they show kind of the maximum in viscosity, almost gel-like viscosity. Uh, but as you kind of continue increasing the, the salt concentration, you see that the uh, it becomes more liquid-like again. So you go through this transition from uh, liquid-like to gel-like to liquid-like again. Um, and you might think that, okay, uh, what is happening in terms of the microstructure that is causing this reversion uh, back to kind of a liquid-like low viscosity state. Um, and there is a couple of hypotheses uh, in, that, uh, in, that, um, in that case, in the sense that uh, two of the pre prevalent hypotheses is that um, you start obviously with these uh, spherical micelles and, or these rod-like micelles, and then they start and become elongated, and then they kind of entangle. And that's what you're seeing at the maximum viscosity. And then as you increase salt concentrations further, uh, potentially you're either kind of reverting back to these short, uh, shorter micelles or you are kind of inducing branching between them. Um, but again, those are hypotheses on, uh, and you need a technique to kind of further elucidate that, right? Um, but one thing to keep in mind is that this phenomena, which I just talked about, which is primarily going through this maxima in viscosity and coming down, is not only uh, what you would see with sodium chloride, but it is actually a manifestation of other formulation variables. 
So if you introduce some other co-surfactant or if you're changing the pH, so for example, you know that in, in cosmetics and skincare products, uh, you, you usually want to uh, formulate at a pH which is pretty close to the skin pH, right? So you're targeting about a pH 5, 5.5 uh, sort of pH. Uh, you might be formulating at 7 and everything looks uh, nice and hunky-dory at that pH, great viscosity, but as you start to kind of increase, um, as you start to um, and as you start to introduce um, or bring down the pH, you see you lose viscosity. Um, so again, you're undergoing a microstructural change, which is causing that. Um, again, uh, temperature can affect it. Uh, obviously, we talked about salt conditions. Other things which people uh, have noticed in, in the formulation world is that sometimes when you put in um, perfumes or fragrance molecules, uh, which are very complex. Uh, perfumes can consist of many, many different fragrance molecules. And as you put them in, uh, a lot of them are quite hydrophobic and you kind of introduce interactions within the surfactant micelles, which kind of causes uh, a change in the microstructure. So again, you might be having a great surfactant base, but maybe you've decided to change the perfume. Uh, you're working with a new perfume house, uh, different fragrance molecules, and you end up with a problem with viscosity, right? So again, uh, that can be another issue that you have to kind of keep in mind as you are formulating uh, these sort of systems and, and try to understand that, right? So, so that's kind of usually what goes on uh, in these systems. So as we talk through this, uh, this story, um, I'll kind of elucidate further how you can kind of get an in insight into these microstructural changes, right? But before I do that, let's kind of go back to what our target was, right? Our target here was we want to create a more sustainable surfactant base, right? So one of the easiest way, and you know that there's a lot of kind of uh, aspects about going towards sulfate-free and all of that. So we want to replace this workhorse SLES anionic surfactant with a biosurfactant uh, and primarily kind of move towards a more sustainable solution, right? So if you look at the biosurfactants which are coming into the market and which are quite common nowadays, well, well they're common from the perspective of research, but they're not still common in the perspective of uh, commercialization. But at least they are being scaled up. So for example, you have sulfonolipids and ramolipids, uh, which are, are these glycolipids, which are obtained from microbes, right? So, um, and you express, uh, and these microbes express different biosurfactants, and you can do some uh, engineering of, of what, what is specifically being expressed. Uh, these are obviously usually not very pure forms in the sense that sulfonolipids, you usually get either a lactonic or an acidic form. Ramnolipid, uh, you get um, either a mono or diramnolipid, and you're usually working with mixtures of these based on the commercial expression. Now, if I were a, a kind of a pure academic, uh, I'd go to a sigma Aldrich and, and try to get a very pure form of the mono and the pure form of the di and try to understand what happens to the microstructure as I kind of work with these things. But uh, to be pragmatic and work from a formulation perspective and having been in formulation for 20 years, um, what I realized is that very quickly, if people are really going to incorporate these into formulations, we need to be able to understand what sort of microstructural aspects uh, these uh, specific commercial variants are, are bringing in, right? So I actually, instead of going to a Sigma Aldrich, went to kind of the, the suppliers which are scaling these guys up, right? So I went to companies like Evonik uh, uh, and, and, and two other startups. One is a NatSurf, the other is a Holiform, uh, which are actually also changing because the NatSurf Act has, uh, uh, technology on ramnolipids has just been recently uh, acquired by Stefan. Um, and Evonik is already, as you know, a large supplier. So. Well, so most of the large suppliers are moving towards biosurfactants because they know that this is where the world is going. So they need to be on top of the game in terms of commercialization, manufacturing, and understanding the physical chemical properties of these novel surfactants. Okay, so, so what we want to do here is now 
we want to replace uh, the SLES by a biosurfactant. You might ask the question, why are you replacing SLES uh, to a certain extent? Why don't you just start from scratch uh, with a completely biosurfactant system and see how it structures? We will, we are. We are doing that work, um, but one of the things which is important to understand that, again, the target is commercialization, right? So from that perspective, do remember that biosurfactants, although they are being commercialized, the cost is expensive still. Um, so one of the things you want to do is you want to substitute in and slowly make your formulation more sustainable, um, and that will bring the demand for these biosurfactants up, and as you bring up demand, your uh, obviously your cost will start to go down uh, because you will increase supply, right? So again, it's it's that whole aspect about getting the economics right. Uh, and one of the things from a formulation perspective for that is uh, trying to start to substitute SLES with with Cap B uh, with uh, with these biosurfactants. So let's see what happens. So traditional formulations, um, if you'll see. This is viscosity and, and shear rate uh, on the x-axis, and these are done with normal mechanical rheometry. Um, and you'll see primarily that uh, the SNES, which is the one in green with cap B, has the highest viscosity. Um, SNES by itself uh, at 16% at that high concentration is not very high, is not very high in terms of the uh, is, is not as high as SLES in terms of SLES cap B in terms of viscosity, but it does have some viscosity, still has shear thinning characteristics. Now, the one in the blue is where we have reduced uh, the SLES by 2%. Uh, so we bring the SLES down to 12%. Cap B is kept at uh, 2%, but now we've introduced 2% of the biosurfactant CCB. This is the ramnolipid from that surfact, or which is now kind of acquired by Stefan. And you see that uh, there's a, a big loss of viscosity from over 100 uh, Pascal seconds to under 10 Pascal seconds. And you can see in that formulation with the yellow one kind of losing its viscosity as you increase the uh, ramnolipid concentration. So you, just by this small substitution, of ramnolipid, you are completely destructuring the system and you're losing quite significantly uh, the viscosity in, in, in the system. So, and this is published, so you can actually look at this uh, study in this International Journal of Cosmetic Science, and this was published last year, where, where you can again look into uh, more details of, of, of this. But uh, one of the things which I wanted to highlight here today is that, so this is an interesting phenomena which is going on. How do I know what is happening to the microstructure, right? This is the key question. Remember, for establishing that structure property, physical chemical uh, property relationship, and that's going to impact on performance. So the first step of that is to understand microstructure. So how am I going to do that, right? Because my traditional techniques like mechanical rheometry, uh, they're great at giving some insights for very specific systems, but the problem is they are limited in terms of the frequency ranges you can access, and that kind of gives you a limitation in terms of what sort of insights you can get into the, into the microstructure. So this is where we kind of start talking about diffusing wave spectroscopy as a high-frequency optical micro um, And this optical micro rheometer uh, is, a, is an excellent kind of a tool for you to start to get insights into microstructural changes uh, in these systems. So let's talk a little bit about uh, microbiology. And again, this is a, an area which um, uh, has been kind of uh, very close to my heart, if you will, for many years of my, of my career, at least from the very beginning. I started doing um, BWS-based microbiology uh, as part of my PhD. So my PhD thesis, uh, now many, many years ago, was on using diffusing wave spectroscopy to look at microbiology of many different types of complex fluids, from worm-like micelles to pleuronic-based tri-block copolymers um, uh, to hydrophobically modified polymers uh, and things like that, and where we established a, a range of really unique insights uh, into these complex fluids. And there's lots of publications I can point you to uh, from my PhD and, and onwards in my career where, where I've utilized 
uh, microbiology, and and uh, and I can point you to that. Um, if you're interested, do let me know. Send me a, uh, an email. Uh, but the principle here is very simple. So primarily, what we do in a microbiology experiment is we embed uh, probe particles or tracer particles into the complex fluid of interest. Uh, and you know that if you're just in a Newtonian fluid, uh, these uh, probe particles are obviously just moving around by normal Brownian motion. But when you're in a complex fluid, uh, and this you can see by these red uh, balls or dots but da dancing around, uh, but when you're in a complex fluid, uh, like a polymer system or a structured surfactant system, obviously the motion of these particles are going to be impacted by the surrounding microstructure of the system. And you can see that in this cartoon uh, where you have these blue kind of spheres kind of uh, entrapped and, uh, within this uh, polymer matrix and moving around and you see that the motion is being impacted um, by the surrounding microstructure. So from the motion of these particles or the diffusion of these particles, uh, we can start to uh, extract out what is the rheological response of the, of the fluid. So you can think of uh, this as, a, as, a, as a, almost a, a rheometry experiment, where basically kind of the, the particles are moving around by kind of this Brownian motion. So the stress uh, is basically the, uh, the Brownian stress, which is KBT, which is Boltzmann's constant times the temperature. And the strain is basically the, the, the motion of the, the, the distance of the motion of the, of the particles. So there's two different ways of doing uh, microbiology, uh, or this is known as passive microbiology because you're depending on the motion of the part of the particles uh, uh, for kind of you're not inducing any additional stresses. Uh, I do, do want to note that there is another microbiology technique known as active microbiology, where you're using, I, I guess, uh, optical traps uh, or, or magnetic. Uh, kind of traps to kind of move particles with known stresses, and that's known as active microbiology. And that's uh, you can find uh, various microscope-based techniques to do that. Um, but here, what we're going to talk about is passive microbiology, where we're dep depending on the Brownian motion as the stress, uh, uh, and then we're kind of uh, extracting rheological properties of the of the uh, of the fluid from that. And as I mentioned, there's two different routes you can do that. You can do it through normal dynamic light scattering based microbiology, um, or you, in which case you need to kind of obviously um, uh, kind of look at uh, some of the limitations of that technique, especially in terms of the frequency range that you can access. Um, and then there's the diffusing wave spectroscopy microbiology, which, uh, which I'm going to talk about here. Um, and again, if you're looking for kind of some insights into how to do these experiments, um, uh, the Rheologic Acta article is very good, especially in terms of the caveats you need to take into account when choosing tracer particles, because the choice of that has to be important, and that's important both for DLS and DWS-based uh, microbiology. But one of the key aspects and the main points of difference here, uh, which I want to highlight, is that the DS, DWS allows access to very high frequencies, which are going to give you that insights into the microstructure that you need. And such high frequencies are not accessible in DLS microbiology. They're definitely not accessible in a mechanical rheometer. Uh, so that's something to keep in mind. Uh, so how does it work? So again, DWS depends on um, kind of uh, looking at multiple scattering. So uh, again, these uh, particles that you are embedded in the complex fluid are undergoing multiple uh, scattering. Uh, and the principle is very similar to dynamic light scattering in which the you kind of have a laser beam kind of uh, focused on the uh, tracer particles which are moving around. And these traces particles are scattering light, which um, you are kind of collecting on a, on a detector. Um, and basically, primarily uh, from that uh, intensity fluctuations of the scattered uh, of the scattered light, you can uh, extract out a, a correlation function, you know, which you also get in a, a dynamic light scattering experiment. So it shouldn't be uh, unfamiliar. Um, and from that uh, kind of um, 
a correlation function, you can then move, uh, get uh, to a mean squared uh, displacement. Um, and then uh, you're using a, a, a kind of a, a theory known as generalized Stokes-Einstein relationship, and you finally get to your rheological properties of interest. So you can extract out G prime and G double prime, which is the elastic modulus and the viscous modulus over a wide range of frequencies. So that's the technique that we utilize to understand microstructural insights in these systems. So this kind of brings us to kind of the, the data uh, that we extracted uh, in this system in the sense that um, primarily if you look at this uh, plot, we, uh, we obtained this G prime, G double prime as a function of angular frequency. Note uh, the x-axis here, uh, which covers this very, very wide range of frequencies. If you were using a mechanical rheometer, uh, you would probably stop somewhere just uh, slightly above 100 radians per second. Uh, so these uh, kind of several uh, decades of frequency uh, that you're getting in this uh, data, you would not be obtaining uh, in, uh, in a mechanical rheometer. So why is this interesting? Now, if you start looking at the data, just to highlight, uh, the three data sets are the three samples I showed you at the beginning when I showed you the biosurfactant samples, right? And remember the color coding on them. They were green, red, and uh, blue. Uh, the green one was the traditional surfactant base, the SLES cap B, 14% SLES, 2% cap B. Um, the red one was just SLES by itself at, six, at 16 weight percent. And the blue one was this combination of um, uh, SLES. 12% uh, cap B, 2%, and the CCB or the biosurfactant 2%. So this is where we introduced uh, the biosurfactant uh, at 2%. We substituted 2% of the SLES. So that's the system that you're looking at. So it's the exact same system where you have the figures uh, in terms of the, the viscosity versus shear rate curve in the couple of slides before. And you had also the pictures of the actual formulations uh, and you saw how it lost viscosity. So what am I getting from the DWS? As I mentioned, you for mechanical rheometer, you'd stop at 100 radians per second. But here, this additional decades of frequency, you'll see that there's a really rich information in here, especially if you look at the high frequency, very high frequency end, you see that you get a second crossover between G prime and G double prime. So that's very interesting. So if you kind of start to look at uh, the one like my cell theory and you start to go back into this, and these are very old papers from Mike Cates and others going over many, many years ago, uh, where they kind of established that worm-like my cells obviously uh, have Maxwellian response. And um, especially at these very high frequencies, what you're getting is basically you're kind of kicking in uh, another relaxation mechanism which is not reptation, but primarily kind of uh, due to these rouse moods. Um, and these rouse moods are kind of related to kind of the kind of the, uh, the, uh, the, the flexibility and, uh, and motion of the, of, the, of the worms. And that flexibility is connected to the uh, persistence link. Remember when I was introducing some of the structural parameters which are important here, uh, I introduced this flexibility term, uh, which was related to the uh, persistence length, or LP. And if you look at this uh, high-frequency crossover, you can actually uh, go down uh, to the frequency at which this crossover occurs. And from there, at this bottom equation here, uh, you can get out your LP term, which is, gives you an idea about uh, flexibility in these micelles. Uh, once you get that, you can kind of plug it into this middle equation uh, and kind of get your entanglement link because all other parameters, including G0 and LP, are known at that point. And then you take that LE and you plug it into the top equation and you get an idea of the contour length. So by this high-frequency analysis, we have completely uh, done the structural analysis of the worm like micelle forming uh, in this system. And if you look at the data primarily, if you look at the uh, green one, that is the traditional SLES cap B system, you see you have a contour length of about 445 nanometers. You have an entanglement length of 23 nanometers and a persistence length of 22 nanometers. 
Now, if I go straight to the blue one, which is the one at the bottom where I have substituted uh, 2% of the SLES with, uh, uh, with, uh, with 2% uh, biosurfactant, you see that I have a drastic reduction in the contour length. It's going down from 445 nanometers uh, to 88 nanometers. And you see um, that the entanglement length uh, increases a lot, 50 nanometers, which means there's a big distance between entanglement points, but the flexibility does not change that much. So if I look at this perspective, from that perspective that I'm actually moving, so the persistence length is kind of, again, the, the range at which it remains stiff. So I'm now kind of uh, reducing the contour length significantly. Uh, so the range over which it remains stiff is much, is much bigger. Uh, and there are fewer entanglement points. So that means that I'm going from a long uh, entangled worm like myself to a short, more stiffer rods. Um, and that's obviously going to make a big difference in my rheological response, right? Uh, so that's kind of an interesting uh, uh, kind of uh, observation here uh, in terms of what I've done to the micelles when I've done that. Um, now, if I look at SLES by itself, where it didn't have any cap B, it's not that different from this system. It has a contour length about 94. The entanglement length is still longer. Uh, persistence length is slightly shorter. Uh, but in general, uh, in terms of contour length, uh, it's pretty similar to this uh, sort of system where I have introduced um, this um, uh, biosurfactant uh, into, uh, in, into the system. So uh, that's quite interesting. So the fact is that I am doing something to the to the to the microstructure, which is causing me to kind of get to shorter, stiffer rods. So from long uh, entangled worm like myself. So again, think of it as going uh, in the opposite of cooking. So I'm going from end of these uh, cooked spaghetti type of systems to uncooked spaghetti, if you will, uh, from that perspective when I introduce this biosurfactant. Um, so the question in any formulator's mind is always, uh, can I build back this rheology? So you showed us before that you can build it back with, uh, with sodium chloride. If I add salt, can I do this again for this biosurfactant-based system? And so we tried to do that, and you'll see here that, yes, uh, you kind of get back this salt curve, but just look at the viscosity build. It's very, very little. You're just, yeah, you're increasing uh, the viscosity a bit, but it very quickly starts to reduce, um, kind of, uh, you start to lose viscosity again very quickly. Um, so salt is not affecting it much. Um, and uh, primarily that is, uh, you will see that, uh, again, if you start to look at the structural parameters, uh, yes, you are increasing the contour length uh, to 83 with salt, um, but that's kind of taking it to the SLES level, not to the SLES cap B level, which was about 445 nanometers, right? Mm -hmm. And then as you start increasing salt concentrations more, you again have this drastic reduction uh, from that perspective of, of, the, of the contour length. So again, uh, salt is not the answer for us uh, from a formulator's point of view. So what else can we do? We can obviously change the pH. Um, and this is uh, interesting here if you look at this. So if you look at uh, all the data I showed you before with the biosurfactant was almost neutral pH, so 7.47. Um, now uh, what, you, what I've done is reduce the pH to 6.5. Um, and you'll see here a couple of observations. Obviously, the elastic modulus increases. Um, uh, you get much more of this traditional uh, Maxwellian response type uh, of G prime, G double prime versus frequency back. Um, and if you start to kind of look at the, the data, you start to see that you build back the structure. So what's happening in this case? So the, the hypothesis, and this is actually further validated by some other surface activity measurements we did, and that's published somewhere else. Uh, but uh, in terms of the microstructural uh, aspects that is going on, uh, the story that we're coming to is the following. So primarily when you have SLES cap B, remember when I first introduced SLES cap B, I said that the betaine actually facilitates the worm-like micelle formation 
uh, with SLES, right? Um, so as a cap B, BTM really likes to be with, uh, uh, with the uh, SLES. Now I have introduced a third character to the story, right? And this third character is, uh, is the biosurfactant. Um, for, so, so for some reason, um, this uh, biosurfactant, now when it sees this, uh, by, uh, when it sees the cap B, uh, it seems that the cap B, instead of going with the SLES, tends to form micelles with the, uh, the biosurfactant. Now remember at this pH, uh, 7.47, um, uh, the SLES is still anionic, but the uh, biosurfactant we had, the ramnolipid, is also anionic, but the uh, 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 betaine is zuterionic. So under these conditions, it seems that the zuterionic uh, uh, betaine uh, likes to interact with the anionic biosurfactant rather than interacting with the anionic SLES. Uh, so you have this uh, binary system, binary surfactant system, uh, micellar system in this, in this formulation where you have uh, micelles formed by the biosurfactant and the betaine and then the SLES, uh, which is orphaned and staying by itself and forming micelles, separate micelles. So, uh, and SLES by itself cannot form a long one like micelles, so it's not very effective uh, in terms of the, the structure that you're getting in terms of viscosity build. So the story is primarily, and, and that's validated. You saw that, uh, that the values were similar uh, to what SLES was doing by itself. So we were kind of probing some of these uh, long worms which are being formed by these, uh, not long worms, but shorter worms formed by SLES by itself. And, uh, and primarily that's what we were kind of probing uh, when we're doing these measurements because we were not getting these long worms formed by the cap B in the presence of the SLES. But when we reduce the pH, the uh, zuta, the uh, the biosurfactant takes on more of a non-ionic nature, and the uh, cap B the becomes more uh, from zuterionic starts to move towards being more cationic. Under those conditions, it starts to favor more of the interaction uh, with the uh, SLES. So it uh, so SLES gets back its old partner, uh, in this case uh, betaine and restarts to form these long worm-like micelles, and now the biosurfactant, uh, which is non-ionic, is by itself. So that's pretty much the hypothesis which we're seeing. And to further validate this, as I said, we did surface activity measurements where we saw strong synergistic interactions between the betaine and the uh, biosurfactant, which further gives credence to this hypothesis. But again, uh, if you want to read about this whole system in more details, do refer to the publication uh, where you have a lot more details on, on that aspect. So again, uh, this still kind of tells you the story of the importance of utilizing the diffusing wave spectroscopy to start to give you these insights, which can then give you the, the story and the mechanistic understanding and kind of if in your heads, start to form these cartoons about what's actually happening uh, in the system. Um, so that's really interesting for these sort of systems where you can start to explore um, kind of what's happening in body washes, shampoos, and these surfactant structured systems. But you can ask the question, so how does, um, uh, how does this sort of uh, technique help us understand other cosmetic formulations, which might be emulsions. Um, so one of the things which uh, we are starting to explore and probe, and, uh, and uh, we think there's a, a kind of a uniqueness of DWS in terms of looking at these some other uh, aspects about cosmetics, is about emulsion stability monitoring. Again, uh, all of you who are working in cosmetics, you know that this is a, a kind of a uh, a challenging area where if you could predict which formulations or kind of get insights of, of which formulations are going to have issues with stability early on, that would give you a lot of value. So again, uh, because DWS is a very sensitive measure of, of diffusion at very short time scales, 
um, you might be able to access uh, some understanding of that. So again, that's something which we are uh, building understanding on. Uh, you can kind of utilize uh, the technique to measure active release monitoring, sometimes in pharma and, and even in cosmetics. Um, so, for example, you can use MISER systems to encapsulate uh, uh, kind of various actives. And if the active uh, uh, under encapsulation has one microstructure, and as you start to release it, the microstructure of the surfactant system starts to change, uh, you might be able to monitor that uh, again uh, through the change of the microstructure. You can kind of correlate that to the extent of active release or drug release. Um, uh, one of the areas which has um, been uh, studied initially, but I think uh, requires more look uh, into, is looking at foam dynamics. Uh, you know that foams, again, which is very important for in use sensory, especially as you're generating foams. Uh, a lot of the sensory feel of products is also related to, to foam uh, rheology, for example. Um, and foams are dynamic systems because uh, they are always uh, changing by drainage and coarsening. And that's related uh, to the foam rheology that you observe and therefore the texture of the foams. So DWS may be utilized uh, potentially uh, again, the method has to be further developed uh, to kind of explore uh, how this uh, foam drainage, uh, as you change formulations, how the foam drainage and coarsening is taking place, not only for uh, foam uh, stability, but foam quality and the richness of the foam, all of that might be related to this. So again, there might be an, an option to utilize uh, the DWS technique uh, for that, uh, from that perspective. So that's pretty much all I had uh, in terms of covering this area. Um, I think I've gone a little bit over, we are at 11.50, but um, uh, I, the, in terms of the technical part of the, of the talk, I want to kind of um, uh, leave it at that. But I do want to highlight again, some aspects of the DWS, uh, which is again, uh, has advantages over uh, a rheometer. Um, one of them I've already covered, which is basically this access up to very high frequencies, uh, up to getting up to 10 to the 6 radians per second. Again, as I said, uh, with a mechanical rheometer, you'd stop at about 100 um, and maybe slightly over. Uh, and so that's a clear advantage where this high frequency gives rise to getting uh, insights on, on microstructural changes. Um, again, a uh, lot of samples are stress sensitive. So when you put them on a rheometer, you know you can be breaking the structures uh, as you start to kind of use a mechanical rheometer. Um, so one of the things here is that we don't put, put any stress on these samples in order to get G prime, G double prime. We're just uh, uh, kind of depending on the Brownian motion of these particles. So that's one aspect to, to keep in mind. Uh, the other aspect is also uh, when you are using samples in a rheometer, because it's open, you can do, you can use uh, solvent uh, evaporation traps and things like that. But one of the advantages of, of our DWS, you're doing this experiment in a cuvette. So especially as you're doing temperature ramps and temperature studies, uh, again, you're doing it in a sealed cuvette. So again, you don't usually run into the problems of sol solvent evaporation, which you might run into uh, um, in, a, a, in a rheometer. Uh, and the other aspect is that it's very sensitive. Uh, any type of optical microbiology is a very sensitive uh, uh, kind of measurement. So if you're kind of uh, generating weak microstructures, and this might be the case uh, in protein systems and other systems, uh, where we've actually, I've actually done optical microbiology on those systems, you can pick up uh, changes in the microstructure in a much more sensitive way. Um, so that's pretty much uh, some of the key advantages of, of utilizing a DWS a rheometer, micro rheometer uh, over a, a mechanical rheometer from that perspective. There are a lot of references uh, in terms of uh, Again, uh, you can look at this study, but there are kind of a lot of backgrounds uh, on microbiology technique itself. Um, and obviously you can refer to the LS Instruments website, which has also additional application notes and some other 
uh, key uh, information for these sort of techniques. And uh, that before I want to, uh, before I finish, I just want to acknowledge all my students uh, at Manhattan College. Obviously, they've done all the work. I'm only a messenger. Uh, giving you kind of uh, and highlighting all the work that they they've done, but all the credit goes to them, not to me. Um, and uh, and uh, also want to thank all our uh, uh, suppliers and uh, collaborators who have given us uh, this uh, of these uh, chemicals, and obviously also to LS Instruments uh, for helping us through this journey, and also uh, for giving me the opportunity to present uh, this work. Um, again, thank you so much, uh, Colleen, for the opportunity. And with that, uh, I hand it over back to you. Thank you very much, Samuel, for giving us this presentation today. And for the second part of this webinar, I would like to um, switch now to the question and answer session.